Um, all right. You also had to roll? We're having problems with the computer, and I called IT, and they're going to come over. So, um, what I'm going to do is go over this lecture. I'm also going to post, I don't know how to get to it today, but I'm going to put a couple of things on Canvas for you so that you can see. I was going to show it in here, but I'm already too far behind to, um, to show it in here. So I'll post it and you can pick it up there. Um, if you remember last week, or week before, when we were doing the thoracentesis, that patient, um, we drained it, let her go home. Well, in between that time, she comes back to the hospital and she's still short of breath, whatever. So they decide that they're going to put the chest tube in her. Now, like a lot of my clinical students said, they were just terrified of chest tubes. If when you leave out of here, you should not be scared of a chest tube. You should be able to fix it in a second. Same thing like if you had to get away in a hurry and there's a truck parked in the field, all you hear about is it has four tires, an engine, you don't need to know anything about the engine. Four tires, a push button, start, and steer, and go. Okay, that's all you need to know. Unless you guys need to do all the computer stuff and map it in where you're going and that. But otherwise, just the plain basics. That's what I want you to know with this. To where if you've been out six months and you haven't seen one, or if you've been in the ICU and you have never seen one, and then all of a sudden you get one on your floor, I don't want you to panic because there's certain safety things that you can do. Now for this Oxy 2 Part 2, the first part of this is we're going to cover the chest tube, okay? What we use it for and how to troubleshoot it. That's one of the SLOs on there. The next part of it is going to be the conditions that we have, like pneumothorax, those kind of things. And we're going to get into that. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Um, you got to get a chest tube. It can drain the blood. Fluid, remember? Blood, fluid, whatever else is in there. Pus, it comes in a blue pack, like this, sterile procedure, and uh, you do not put it in, the doctor puts it in. Uh, no, we turned it upside down. <laughs> oh, I can fix it. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, someone probably didn't know. Matthew, is that you? Yeah. You know what Matthew means? Gift from God. Because if my, my oldest daughter was a boy, she was going to be Matthew, and that means gift from God. So good to see you, buddy. He helped me across the hall first day of class. Matthew. This is why you, you still do things the hard way with hard copies, you know? Um, anyway, so time out, all those same things, consent. There you go. I thought it was this, but the screen, um, it has a, <clears throat> see this? Wait, how did you touch that? But it's still upside down. Watch, I'm going to change it. Give from God, that was your Matthew. I'm making this stuff up. Yeah. Yeah. It's like this. Yeah. So yeah. now it's, you know, the way it was. So we 
likes to ask you those kind of questions. That's why I did the Thoris and Thesis first last week, so you wouldn't get them mixed up. And believe me, students get them mixed up. All right, he's gonna, um, anybody seen a chest tube put in? No. Um, It's not the nicest thing to put in. They're gonna use, they're gonna come in containers like, like this. They're either gonna be laying down, they're either gonna be laying like this or they're gonna be in a box. And usually people number them, like this one's a, um, a 28, this one's a 16. The bigger the number, the bigger the two, okay? They can come straight, or they can actually come curved. Sometimes they're coated with some heparin plastic, PVC, whatever. So you can imagine having um, this stuck into your side. It's not a really nice feeling. What he's gonna do is he's gonna open up that kit, clean it, and remember with the thoracentesis, we listened to the lungs, did the procedure, sent them to x-ray, brought them back, listened to the lungs again. Same thing here. You're gonna listen to the lungs before they put this chest tube in. He's already got, then he had the um, chest x-ray, so we know we gotta put the tubes in. <coughs> Patient's sitting there, and <clears throat> what this doctor's gonna do is, he's gonna find between the two ribs, He's gonna deaden that area with some lidocaine. Remember we use lidocaine for the thoracentesis. 1% lidocaine. And, uh, and you know that all goes sub-Q so that they don't feel the initial one. Puts that in, then he's gonna take his scalpel and he's gonna cut that area. But before he puts that tube in, he's gonna take his hand and his finger, and he's gonna put that finger in between those two ribs. And it's really the first time you ever see it, you go, oh my God, what is that guy doing to that patient? It'll like blow you away, because it is a really gory picture. And when he does that, the reason he's doing that is He's going to check with his finger first to be sure he's in the right spot. So then he's going to put that tube in there. Next then comes the chest tubes. Um, 
I have two different types of chest tubes here. If you look at them, is there something particular that you see that makes them different? You know, like this thing in the magazines, which picture is, do you see that's different? What do you see is different? Just describe what you see. Okay. This one's also different colors. Is that what you mean? Okay, you can you can do it like that, but this has a water column. This one, you're going to see this orange sticker just about everywhere. Okay, you control it. There's like a paddle wheel back here on the back, and I'm going to pass these around as a paddle wheel, and you can control it. And just like um, your IVs, you can set it at whatever rate. If you want it at 40, you move it at 40. You set this according to what the doctor orders. You check this on your assessment to be sure it's where it's at. People have a tendency to get these wrong sometimes. If you notice, it's all negative. And remember last week, everything the body likes is negative in there. So you're never gonna have a positive number. It's always gonna be a negative number. So, there's a picture of this chest tube in your book. And there's also, the name brand on this is Atrium. Both of these are Atrium. Kind of like a car, a Chevy, a Ford, all does the same thing. This one is considered a dry unit because it's kind of like all in one. You don't have to do a whole lot with it. This one is considered a water, a wet one. Now, yesterday, considering we must have had 15 chest tubes, almost all of them were dry. And they all have this column for purposes of driving that truck in the field. All you need is over here is just drainage numbers. It takes up almost two thirds of the thing. And there's a reason those numbers are there. It started 10 and it has a kind of a um, material where you could take a, a permanent marker and you can mark it. It's seven o'clock. She's got 20 cc's in. So you're gonna mark 20 cc's 7 a.m. And you're gonna watch it during the day. Now, if you're an ICU, you're doing this every hour. Um, and let's say it's seven o'clock, you're going home, and she's got 140. So you can put, this is gonna be your, uh, part of your I and O's, okay? So you're gonna count that, but you're not gonna empty this. Ms. Dickerson. Tuesday afternoon, raise your hand if you're in my Tuesday clinical. Raise your hand high so Ms. Dickerson can see. We had a patient that needed an emergent cabbage, and this patient was allergic to heparin, so they received a medication called Argatraban, which is direct thrombin inhibitor, and they were bleeding. They dumped two liters in that chest tube, and all of my students on Tuesday got to see it. So I asked them the question, what do we do with this full chamber? Do we empty it? No, they got a second chamber. It was something to see, Ms. Dickerson. They didn't uh, auto transfuse it? Oh, then? Ms. Dickerson, that patient got six units of packed RVCs, four units of FFP, a unit of platelets. The deal with our gatraban is you can't reverse it, like heparin with protamine, and it just had to wear off. She's not actively bleeding anymore. She did get a unit of packed RVCs yesterday. But her H and H was kind of stable. It was something to see. Well, only the dry. Okay. 
<coughs> only the dry unit has this dial on it, okay? Another way you could tell is it says, it does say oasis, and if you think of the desert and the spas, it's an oasis. Over here, it says ocean, so that should give you some idea that it's a wet one. Uh, used to this was all we had, well before they had bottles and you literally had to build your own suction thing. Then they came up with, with this next and you had to fill it up with water, there's a spot to fill it up with water and all of that. Then they came out with the dry one where it's like ready to go. But, um, We are going to troubleshoot. I want you to know what to do. Not so much as you can take months in the ICU till you get to that. All right, if you notice, you're gonna to have to look at that in your book or Google it, it's usually all over the place, but they're labeled A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D. They're labeled in the book. You gotta know what those are and what they do because this is part of your equipment. Um, we already know the first part. You already got the first one down, right? Because you know the drainage. You're gonna mark, like everything else, what color it is. Is it yellow? Is it red? Is it dark red? Is it bright red? Is it pus? You know, is it clear yellowy? Um, you're gonna have to describe it. If you have more than 70 or 100 cc's in an hour, standard rule is, you know, you need to call your doctor. Um, especially if it's bright red blood. Now, if you work in those areas in ICU and you know those procedures and when they're coming back, they usually put out a certain amount. Um, that's different. But it's not, it's if you were on the floor and all of a sudden it increased 100 cc's an hour, you better like start looking. Okay, um, you round on these and you check these at, if you're on the floor every two to four hours. At the end of your shift, you're gonna check and put down how much you got out of it. And yet, like yesterday, I showed the students, every doctor pulled up every H&P, and they write daily notes the doctors do, and they add it to it. And um, every one of them put their I and O, the doctor, to where he saw that, you know, if they pull his records, they could see that the doctor acknowledged he put out that. And the reason that, that was really pretty good is because we had a patient that only put out 24 cc's in 24 hours, okay? Um, that's why those I and O's are so important, and especially if they've got a tube like this. So, most of these patients are gonna be hooked up on monitors, but the reason that I tell you to monitor it, um, when I, right after I got out of school, one of my friends went to work in an ICU in Houston. And one of the new nurses that night, um, I mean, you gotta remember this was almost 40 years ago, so we didn't have monitors all over the place. We were still wearing caps. And um, the patient was here, and this was like the door and they had the chest tube on this side of the patient. And it was a child, I think like, I don't know, 10, young. Well, when she finally went in to 
to do her vital signs, this chest tube had got pulled out. And he literally bled out. He didn't make it. So, I don't want that to happen to you. I want you to be, all you gotta do is glance at it and see. And, oh my God, look at that color. Wait, that's bright red. We better call somebody. Now, all right, this one, if you notice and see, they have little tiny bubbles. And I'm gonna try to put it, put the video up for those of you that haven't seen it and um, what happens. But what I want you to know, just the takeaway point is, if you see excessive bubbling in here, it shouldn't be there, okay? The only time you should see anything moving is when they take a breath. That's the only time, or exhale. Just kind of like, think about the cardiac monitors and the patient coughs or moves or reaches over how you get that artifact on the thing and it's not, oh my God, you know, something's wrong with him. It's not, it's just he's moving and it's picked that up. Same thing here. It'll rise and fall with his respirations, but you don't want it bubbling excessively. And the only way I know to, that you can, that I could remember that when I was doing it was kids that uh, blow bubbles in their drink and you're out in a restaurant and it's loud and noisy and it irritates the people next to you. So all that heavy bubbling is not good, okay? This is gonna regulate the pressure of the suction that they want. That's a doctor's order. All you gotta do is put it on the number, okay? Now, if these get full, you get another one. It has little feet on it. And uh, you know, it's a shame you can't take pictures of people in the hospital anymore because I would have loved to have taken this picture of this guy in ICU yesterday. He was walking with his walker and he had three chest tubes hanging on his walker. And um, he had recently had a cabbage, but it was really, it was a priceless picture to see someone in the ICU walking the halls with three chest tubes, like you're walking with a bowler. Um, but it has these little feet. You're gonna put these, where are you gonna put this? Remember, everything has a position. This is gonna go below the level of the chest because we wanna drain it. If we put it up here like an ID, it's not, the blood's not gonna get from here all the way up here. So you want it below the level of the chest. Sitting on the floor, okay? What happens, we usually tape it so that it doesn't move and label it, but uh, you may see some of them like this and don't worry about it. If the family knocks it over, you just stand it up, pick it back up. Your blood may go in one of these you know, other things, but you can still calculate it. You don't need to do anything else with it. Transporting it. Same thing, the patient's gotta go to CT. It goes on the rail at the bottom, okay? Below the chest. Do not put this in his bed like people do with Foley's. You know, for a long time, they didn't want you to uh, escort a patient in the halls that had a Foley because of visitors. So they wanted you to put the Foley laying on the bed and covered. And I've seen nurses do that with this. Don't do this, you're probably gonna kill your patient. 
Um, so it's going to stay lower. All right. Look what we got here. Oh my goodness. This is like six feet long. So a lot of things could go wrong with this. So you have never ever worked in a critical care unit and they pulled you up. They had no nurses. And you walked in and you saw the chest tube and said, oh no, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You know how to count, you know how to read, and you can see bubbles. Those are two things that you don't want. This, you're going to make sure that this has no knots in it, no dependent loops in it. Twist it up where it can get kinked. Patient's laying in a bed. Where do you think it's going to get kinked at? What else is in the beds? The rail. Okay. So, <coughs> check. I know you check your foley's to see if they're draining. Same thing with this. This part is going to be in the patient. Now, as long as he's hooked up to suction, the techs are not going to take him for a walk but they can walk with these, if they're up to it. They just have to hold it lower. So what's the other thing, the worst thing that you could possibly happen to you, which actually happened to us, what's the worst thing that could happen to you? It comes out. Actually had a patient, a 26 year old, had a chest tube, um, drug user, he pulled it out Tuesday, I think. Pulled it out Tuesday, wanted to go, and went AMA to go get cigarettes, said he'd be back. Well, he was back, and he was intubated when he came back. So, um, but he pulled his own chest tube out, okay? Um, now, it can happen, but it can also, that doctor's going to suture the, that chest tube in. So another thing that you're going to be charting, you're going to be looking at that dressing, and you're going to chart if it's dry and intact, you know, the whole thing, what color it is if it has something on it. If you're there when he puts this in, you can put in there the sutures. I'll usually ask how many put in and I'll write that in my notes. Usually he's gonna put in maybe two and the patient's gonna go to x-ray. X-ray's okay, placement's okay, comes back, he's gonna put the other three sutures in there. But some doctors just don't want to do it twice, so they'll just suture it all up and send them to x-ray. Just be sure you double check it. And that's when sometimes those chest tubes fall out because nobody came back and put the other three sutures in there, okay? So, we have this little thing. Oh, this must be like an IV. I can put it in here and I can clamp it. No, you cannot clamp it. If, let's say, you have a patient and your patient was ready to go home, that doctor is going to come and he's going to clamp it for about 20 minutes. He'll leave and you better watch your patient because he's trying to decide if her lungs are inflated. If you see no bubbling, absolutely no um, increased drainage, two things could have happened. One, 
the lungs are better. They don't need this thing anymore. Or it could be kinked somewhere. So you're gonna call the doctor and he's gonna come and check to see if it needs to come out or if it got kinked inside. So he's gonna put, he's gonna clamp this. You keep an eye on him, come back in 20 minutes and if your patient is short of breath and turning blue, what's the first thing you think you would do? Oh, Unclamp it. Okay, um, you have to rescue that patient immediately, and that's how you do it. You just unclamp it. Otherwise, she's probably gonna get another clot or another pneumo in there. And it does happen. They get busy, they forget, or they got a code, and so check on your patients with this. Like I said, you're gonna do it in the ICU all the time. They're gonna be on monitor. Yes, it'll warm whenever you know they stop breathing, but it just makes life much easier on you. So here comes the confusing part. If you still have all that bubbling and stuff, something's going on, and you suspect there's a leak somewhere, you're gonna start at the patient's site first, okay? And you're gonna work your way down. How are you gonna check that? You're gonna have some padded clamps at the bedside. <clears throat> Just like you have wire cutters for a fractured jaw that's been sutured at the bedside. And you're gonna take those padded um, <clears throat> instrument and you're gonna pinch this off and you're gonna see here see there's an air thing only for a second if you don't see anything nothing changes on that you're gonna go down a couple more inches clamp it again look real quick nothing and you're gonna work your way all the way down um most of the time it's at the site that's why you're going to work your way down, and it's a lot safer. Some folks have said to start to check the machine first, but um, to stay consistent, check your patient. Now, worst thing that could come out, right? We already know what to do if it's clamped and they're turning blue. We can fix that in a second. <laughs> what if this entire thing comes out? Uh, other than the guy doing A&A, &A, what you're gonna do is, like I said, know your equipment. You're gonna bring in, when you set this chest tube in there, you're gonna set up a sealed 250cc bottle of normal saline or sterile water something that has not been used for the, that you'd have to break the seal on it. That should always be sitting at your bedside. If this tube comes out, we're gonna take that 250 cc's and we're gonna put this in it one to two inches below the water surface. Why are we doing that? because it'll take the air out. You know, you don't need to know all the mechanics. It will take the air out and it will act as a chest tube, okay? Till you can get somebody in there. Well, the doctor's gonna have to, you know, put another one in. But that's what you're doing as an emergency. If you see it dangling out, put it in sterile water one to two inches below the level of the water, okay? Um, now, what happens if um, if your patient got up, went outside to smoke, comes back in, it's 120 degrees outside, he's all sweaty, 
and you're looking at him and his dressing is off. What are you going to do? What? Cover it. Just put another one on it. Okay. See, the only thing, those four or five parts, just like that truck, you just need to know where, how to start it and steer towards wherever you're going. That's all you need to know in here. Um, chest tubes. Um, they do, several of the students have come back to me and told me they had a, a lot of questions on chest tubes. So, um, and it was particular the one, I mean, think of it, they want to know if you're safe. What are you going to do if something happens? They're not going to ask you some little nitpicky thing about this. They're going to ask you if this falls out. Now, if we're going to take this out, remember I said her lung could have expanded if you see nothing else going on down there. Could mean those two things, pinked or whatever. So we're going to try to take this thing out. What you're going to do, and this is not an order question, okay? Um, you're going to medicate that patient. Please give that patient some pain medicine before you pull the sucker out. It hurts. If you guys see the commercial on TV, the cigarette commercial where the lady says, I'm only 52, and she said, this chest tube uh, in my lung hurt a lot more coming out than going in. So I thought, oh, wow, that's interesting. And I think about you guys every time I see that commercial. So we're going to take it out. We're going to give her something for pain. Now, remember we told our Thoris and Jesus person, not to cough or talk or move or do any of that. <coughs> what we're going to do with this patient to take it out, because, it, you know, we've got that whole thing to pull out. As we're pulling that out, what you want this patient to do is to bear down so that the air is not coming in, okay? To where when that doctor pulls it out, She's not taking a big gasp of air. Now, um, the other thing, let's see, 13. Um, it has hangers, it has tubing, you don't want it getting kinked. You don't want it to break off from the patient. I'm going to tell you something else with this, and I'll do it when we go to the next part. I know last week, I don't think you guys, um, I didn't have the kit for the thoracitesis for you guys, right? Um, I mean, this one, this isn't much. But I just wanted to, to let you see, it comes in the packet and everything. Um, this is the bag that they're going to put the thing in. We did like four of these yesterday. And um, that's going to get connected. Here's all the tubing. You don't have to worry about it. He does all of this. But when I remember when I was telling you about um, tell them not to cough, I mean, look at the size of this. And they're going in. So you can see how easy it is to puncture that lung or the other one or the spleen. And um, so that's why you don't cough. That's why I had you do the pen thing, so you could remember. Um, <coughs> the band-aid that they put on it, the 
the, the students yesterday were laughing and they said, oh, and they had a Band-Aid on them, just like you said in the class. It was funny. But the test tubes, the lidocaine, and if it's a big patient, you may need more bottles of this. Um, the 3cc syringe, well this one's fine. To uh, draw it up, I'm just gonna draw that up with a little needle. And they usually, like I said, draw off anywhere from 1,000 to 1,400. I'd be careful if you draw it off any more than that. Um, all right, I'm gonna let you take a break from this part. And next part, for this and you come back we're going to go over what you're going to use this equipment for so it's going to be easy peasy for you i promise